Today's video is going to cover a bit more detail about the first three steps of viral replication, attachment, penetration, and encoding. And we're gonna provide a few examples of how different viruses manage these three steps. The two big questions we're going to answer today are what governs attachment, which we've already talked about a little bit, and then what ways can a virus enter a cell in order to begin the processes of biosynthesis? A few key things to remember about the cellular receptors that viruses can use is that they are essential for all animal and bacterial viruses. The second thing to remember is that cellular receptors have a purpose other than virus binding, and viruses exploit these cellular receptors so that they can gain infection of a host cell. This figure at the bottom is showing how influenza attaches to cells. The viral protein hemagglutinin, which is the purple structures here, attaches to sialic acid on host cells. And sialic acid is mostly found in the lungs, which is why influenza is primarily a respiratory infection. And sialic acid coats the cells, interacts with hemagglutinin, and that's the very simple way in which influenza virus is able to attach to its target cells. Now, interestingly, different viruses can actually use the same receptor, can share a receptor. For example, two different viruses, adenovirus and Coxsackie virus, use the same receptor. The receptor is called CAR, the cellular protein CAR, which actually stands for Coxsackie and adenovirus receptor. Now, adenovirus and Coxsackie virus B3 are both human viruses. Another weird example is a virus called pseudorabies virus, which is a swine herpes virus, and human polio virus. They use the same receptor, and it's a protein called Nectin-2. And Nectin-2 is part of the adherence junctions that help to hold our tissues together. So it's this protein that is between the cell-cell junctions that helps to hold our tissues together. And here on the left is that CAR protein, the Coxsackie and adenovirus receptor. So it too is part of those junctions, in this case the tight junctions, that hold tissues together and keep them from falling apart. So on the last slide, I showed you how different viruses can bind to the same receptor, but related viruses can bind to different receptors. So just because the viruses are similar doesn't mean that they share a similar receptor. Rhinoviruses, which cause the common cold, can bind to at least three different receptors. So although the viruses are very, very similar, they can use very different receptors. And the retroviruses can bind to a total of 16 different receptors. Or, on the reverse, one virus can bind to multiple receptors. This is herpes simplex virus 1, which has a number of envelope proteins, and these can each bind to different cellular proteins, such as nectin 1, integrins on our cell surface, or heparin sulfate. So think to yourself, what might be the benefit of one virus binding to multiple receptors? After a virus attaches, how can it get inside the cell? There are a number of different ways that viruses can do this, and we're going to look very briefly at membrane fusion. And this can occur at the cell's membrane or in an endosomal membrane. And viruses can also enter the cell through various means of endocytosis. The simplest way for a virus to penetrate into a cell after attachment is to simply fuse its viral envelope with the cell membrane. So fusion can only occur in enveloped viruses. And in order for a viral envelope to fuse with a cellular envelope, the virus must contain a certain type of protein that's called the fusion peptide. This part of a viral protein is going to insert into the cell membrane, pull the cell membrane and viral envelope close together, and allow those two lipid bilayers to fuse. I'm going to zoom in to the top parts of our figure here and give an example of how this works. Panel A is showing an overview of our enveloped virus interacting with the cellular receptor and triggering fusion of our cell and viral envelopes so that now the viral genome is released into the cytoplasm of the cell. And in this case, penetration and encoding are coupled in a sense that they're happening at the same time. Let's look then at panel B and see what's going on with this fusion peptide. This is showing us the virus 
the viral envelope. And within that viral envelope, we have two proteins. So HN here is going to be the receptor. And this other squiggly thing with the disulfide bonds is the fusion peptide. You can see it begins in a conformation like this. And the actual fusion peptide right here is hidden through these disulfide bonds. When the viral receptor interacts with its cellular receptor here in red, the viral receptor undergoes a conformational change, and so does the fusion peptide. So conformational changes are the key to fusion of the viral envelope with the cell membrane. That viral receptor is now bulging out in places and interacting with the fusion peptide. And now you can see that this fusion peptide has flipped down and embedded itself into the cell membrane. And that will allow the two membranes to be pulled closer together and fusion to occur. The surface of cells is at a neutral pH, so for this, our conformational change is due to physical interactions. Now the other membrane at which viruses can fuse is the endosomal membrane. And if you recall, endosomes have increasingly acidic pH as they move from engulfing something to fusion with uh, a lysosome. So in this case, the conformational change that happens to our fusion peptide is going to be pH dependent. In fusion at neutral pH, it's a conformational change of the fusion peptide due to physically binding to a receptor. In this case, the conformational change is dependent upon acidification of the endosome. For this one, we're gonna look at influenza as our example. And like with fusion at the membrane, this can act for both penetration and uncoating of many viruses that escape from the endosome. So let's zoom in a little bit and look at influenza. So here we have an influenza virus that is already attached to its receptor of sialic acid, and that has triggered the cell to take it up through endocytosis. And influenza is now placed into an endosome. Down here at the bottom panel, we're looking at the shape or the conformation of the influenza fusion peptide. And when influenza first binds, it's in this particular conformation. And the fusion peptide is buried up here in the middle of these complexes. Now, endosomes, again, they begin to acidify over time. So here we have our acidic hydrogen ions being pumped into that endosome. Ideally, what would happen is that the acidic pH would denature and kill anything but viruses are gonna use this to their advantage. So as our endosome begins to acidify, we can see this conformational change to our fusion protein, where now these parts of it are coming out to the side, and this middle part is beginning to be exposed. As we continue acidifying, influenza virus itself is actually going to take those hydrogen ions and pump them through the envelope and into the virus itself. And when this happens, our fusion peptide down here flips out. So it was buried up within and it flipped down and is embedded in the endosomal membrane. Once that happens, once that fusion peptide is inserted into the endosomal membrane, now we can kind of get a picture of what's happening. This whole complex begins to pull together. And as it does, the two membranes are pulled within close proximity. When two membranes get within close proximity, those hydrophobic portions will start to mingle until they merge like so. And now we've essentially created a channel through which the rest of the virus can leave into the cytoplasm. So we can see that really well in the top part of this. This fusion event has occurred. And now here we have all of those viral gene segments released into the cytoplasm and they can begin the step of biosynthesis. Many other viruses actually trick the cells into taking them in by endocytosis. And in fact, influenza does this as well. And if you recall, there are two main pathways of endocytosis. There's clathrin-mediated endocytosis and caviolin-mediated endocytosis. If you haven't learned that before, it's okay. We're not really going to focus on the differences between these types because it gives us the same results. And then there are methods of endocytosis that are independent of both clathrin or caviolin. This is a really busy slide, so let's start by focusing here on the clathrin-dependent endocytosis. Here we have a little virus that is attached to its blue receptors down here, and that attachment triggers the cell to begin clathrin 
mediated endocytosis. These are our little clathrin molecules. They're called triskelions, and they form this nice vesicle around our virus, which brings our virus into the cell. So this is our step of penetration here. Now that it's in that cell, a few things happen. Our vesicle becomes an early endosome and then a late endosome. During this time, we're having a decrease in the pH. It's becoming more acidic. And here at the bottom, we have fusion of our virus with that endosomal membrane. And finally, uncoating with our viral genome in green here in the cytoplasm of the cell. So attachment, penetration, and then uncoating. The same thing occurs with caviolin-dependent endocytosis. Our virus attaches to whatever its receptor is. This triggers receptor-mediated endocytosis, and now our virus is in some sort of vesicle there in the cell. This is the penetration step, and eventually, after a number of steps, we'll have our uncoated virus way down here at the bottom of our slide that we can't see. And again, the same thing with clathrin and caviolin-independent endocytosis. We have attachment, penetration, where we're now in our endosome of some sort, and eventually we will see uncoding and release of the viral genome into the cell. Now any of these methods of endocytosis are independent of whether an envelope is present. So this can happen in both naked and enveloped viruses. So we have a few examples of our enveloped viruses here and here and even here. And our naked viruses, those that lack envelopes, would be shown by this one here. Most DNA viruses, like adenovirus, the herpes viruses, and human papillomavirus, have to get their genome into the nucleus for biosynthesis to occur. So how do they get those genomes all the way into the nucleus, which as you know is a double membrane structure and very well protected by eukaryotic cells? There are four different methods that can be used. Despite being an RNA virus, influenza does actually carry out a lot of its biosynthesis in the nucleus. And for this, each of the gene segments enters through the nuclear pore complex, just like cellular proteins and cellular structures do. The herpes viruses, which are a DNA virus, dock at the nuclear pore complex, which I'm just going to write as NPC, the nuclear pore complex. And then the genome gets deposited genome travels through that complex and into the nucleus. And you can see that here, the viral genome getting into the nucleus and the viral capsid staying on the outside. Adenovirus, another DNA virus, it's kind of similar to her where it docks at the nuclear pore complex and the genome travels through. But in this case, the viral capsid falls apart while the genome is traveling. The sort of dashed lines on the capsid indicate that it's falling apart but the genome is still traveling through into the nucleus. Our very last one, the parvoviruses. These are single-stranded DNA viruses, and these are so super tiny that they just move through the nuclear membrane on their own, and then they uncoat in the nucleus. So here's our tiny little parvoviruses moving into the nucleus on their own. They're so small, and that viral DNA is being released right there into the nucleus. All right, let's recap really quickly. For attachment, all viruses attach to some sort of structure on the cell that acts as a receptor. Penetration, getting the virus into the cell, can occur by membrane fusion. This can occur at the cell membrane or the endosomal membrane, or viruses can get into the cells through endocytosis. Uncoating them can be coupled to penetration in the cases of membrane fusion or it can occur after endocytosis has happened, when a virus may escape from the endosome on its own, or uncoating can occur at the nucleus, when the viral capsid travels to the nucleus and then releases the genome into the nucleus for biosynthesis to occur.